Our first reading this morning is from Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 7, and it's on page 55 in your pew Bibles if you would like to follow along. Hear the word of the Lord. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you stuck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall shall come out of it and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of the Lord. As we continue in this summer sermon series on the Psalms, our psalm for today is Psalm 95. I'll be reading that to you. It's on page 467 in your pew Bibles. And again, let's listen to the word of God. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands are formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, As on the day at Massah in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For forty years I loathed that generation and said they are a people who go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May God add his blessing to the reading and to the hearing of his holy word. The problem was the people had hard hearts. Have you ever met anybody with a hard heart? It's all kinds of things that can make that happen. Sometimes it's just plain old pride. Somebody thinks a little too much of themselves. Sometimes it's bitterness. The person is hurting, and that hurt has taken up permanent residence, and that hurt has become a part of their identity, and it's made them hard. Sometimes... The person just wants something. They want what they want. And if God doesn't allow it, or if God doesn't give it to them, then they harden their heart against him and turn away. But either way, 
A person who has a hard heart will not listen and will not yield and will not humble themselves before God and will not depend on God or repent before God. And all of that was the trouble with the Israelites here in this account that we have before us from Exodus chapter 17. And it's truly amazing that this is what happened, considering all that the Israelites had seen and experienced up to this point. Now, at this point in the history, we're still very early into Israel's departure from Egypt. They haven't even made it to Mount Sinai yet, and that was three months into the trip. So we're still in really early days here. Moses and Aaron and Miriam are leading the people according to God's guidance. And so we're explicitly told here that with this people on the move, when God says go, they go. When God says it's time to stop and make camp, they stopped and made camp. And in our account for today, we see that God leads them to a place called Rephidim. And according to the research I did at Rephidim, there's what's called a wadi there. Now, if you're not familiar, a wadi is a riverbed or a creek bed that in the wet season runs with water, but in the dry season is dry. And this was the dry season. So God led them explicitly, purposefully, to a place where there was no water. So what we have here is an opportunity, a test, to see if the people would trust in the Lord. He had led them to this place to camp. Would they trust that he would provide for their most basic needs. And before we answer that, let's consider what the Israelites had seen and experienced over the previous months. They had seen God send the ten plagues to the Egyptians, including that final plague, the Passover plague, the plague of the firstborn. They had seen God made manifest physically in their presence as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of cloud or fire, excuse me, at night. So if they wanted to know, is God with us today? All they had to do was turn their heads and look and there he was. He's here. They had seen God open and close the Red Sea. They had walked between the walls of water on dry ground. They didn't even get their feet wet or muddy. And then they saw those walls of water close over the Egyptians that were pursuing them, swallowing the Egyptian army up forever. At one of the previous places where God had led them to camp, the water had been bitter and undrinkable. They had seen God direct Moses to throw a stick into the water, and with that, the water had miraculously become sweet and delicious to drink. At another previous camp, the Lord had started to send the manna to them, miraculous bread from heaven that fell six days out of the week for them. It didn't fall on the Sabbath. On the day before, they got twice as much. That manna would fall for 40 years. And on that first occasion, he also provided quail for them to eat since they had wanted meat. They had seen all of this from the hand of the Lord. They had had demonstrated for them over and over and over again how God cared for them, how God was concerned for them. Now the question was, would they trust that just as he was providing their food, that he would also provide their water when they needed it on this particular day. 
And somehow, in spite of all of that, the people did not believe. Somehow, they hardened their hearts and refused to trust in the Lord. We're told the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Sure, I can produce that, right? Moses said, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. They wanted what they wanted. And they grumbled against Moses and said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? We've got a pattern of behavior now. This is the third time in a few short chapters that the people have grumbled and complained and accused Moses and accused God of just bringing them out of Egypt and into the desert just so he could kill them in the worst possible way. The Lord tested them to see if they would believe. But in response, they tested the Lord. They tested his mercy. They tested his patience. They tested his grace. They did not believe. They did not trust. They had hard hearts. And yet, God's patience and God's mercy and God's grace did not run out. Instead, the Lord said to Moses, pass before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb and you shall strike the rock and water shall come out of it and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And we have another miracle from God. Another incredible provision from God. And yet, when it came to naming this place, they didn't name the place after the miracle that God did. Instead, this place earned the name Masa and Meribah, which in Hebrew means testing and quarreling. What should have been a place remembered solely for God's amazing grace and God's amazing love and God's amazing provision was instead remembered as a place of entitlement and rebellion, a place of shame and sin. And folks, that shame and that sin did not stop there at Massa and Meribah. The truth is this generation of Israelites continued to harden their hearts against the Lord over and over and over again. And as a result, they eventually lost their opportunity to enter into the promised land. Instead of spending a year and a half in the wilderness, which was God's original plan, they spent 40 years in the wilderness until that whole generation was gone and it was their children who then entered the promised land. Because they hardened their hearts, they missed their chance to enter into God's promised rest. They missed the blessing. And in our psalm for today, in Psalm 95, we find the author commemorating this event, equipping us so that we don't make the same mistake. Psalm 95 is another one of those beloved songs. I cannot tell you how many times I have sung these words in so many different choirs to so many different tunes. I read it today and I, it's like a jukebox. You know, I switch from tune to tune to tune as I read different words in this psalm. But it's an unusual psalm. It's a curious psalm because generally people really like the first part. Not so much the second part. In fact, I can tell you every time that I have sung Psalm 95, I've sung the first half 
I've never sung the second half. And yet it's the second half that gives us the key teaching here. Listen to what it says. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years I loathed that generation and said they are a people who go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. Okay, maybe I understand why they haven't set that part to music. Wouldn't really work with jazz or I don't know. I have to think about that. But because of these verses, people call Psalm 95 a history psalm. Some people say it's more like a prophetic teaching from the Lord. But think about it. Imagine you're an Israelite, you're going to the temple to worship the Lord, you're bringing your sacrifice, and you hear the temple choirs begin to sing these words, and they say to you, Israelite, while you are worshiping today, while you are bringing your sacrifice before the Lord, if you hear God speak to you, if you hear the voice of the Lord here as you're worshiping today, don't be like our forefathers. Don't make the mistakes that they made. Learn from history. And how do we do that? How do we make sure that we don't make the same mistakes of hardening our hearts against God, of complaining, of being entitled and self-centered and grumbling against God when our lives aren't the way that we think they should be, when we don't get what we think we deserve, when we don't get what we think God should give us? The answer is very simple. The psalm tells us we worship. We worship. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Worship is the antidote to having a hard heart. Worship is the antidote to having a Massa and Meribah experience. Because when you worship... When you sing to the Lord, or for those of you that don't sing or can't sing or don't want to sing or just plain won't sing, there's provision made for you here too. You can make a joyful noise to the Lord, and there are a lot of different ways you can do that. Beth can set you up with a rhythm instrument if that's what you want. <laughs> when we worship, when we lift God up in praise and focus on him and not on me, not on self, not on what I want, not on my problems. When I focus instead on God, I see the good news, which is the Lord is a great God. He is the great king above all gods and in his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. His hands formed the dry land. How often do we forget this? How often do we forget the greatness of our God, the majesty of our God, the power of our God, the splendor of our God? He is a great God. He is king over all of the gods. You put him in a contest with Thor or Apollo or Baal, it's not even a contest. For as the psalm reminds us, our God, the God of Israel, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, he's the one who created all of this. He created the heavens and earth, and they're in his hand. Not hands. He doesn't need even two hands to hold it. He can hold it all in one hand. When we sing, he's got the whole world in his hands. We mean it. That's where we are. Can you imagine even holding the depths of the earth in your hand, or the heights of the mountains, and yet that's what God does. Our God owns them all. Our God owns the sea. Even think about that. Wrap your mind around that. Do you know how big the sea is? He owns it. He made it. And the dry land too. This is 
our God. This is the one into whose presence we have come to worship him today. And of course, as New Testament believers, we have an even greater reason to worship God. For the Apostle Paul tells us in Corinthians, referencing our reading from Exodus 17, that when Moses struck the rock and water gushed out, Paul says that rock was Christ. If you go back and read it, God says that he's going to go and stand there on the rock that Moses strikes. He's going to bear the blows that Moses strikes on the rock. Well, as we know, Jesus was struck, wasn't he, for our benefit. He bore great violence upon himself because of our great need. And from that, living water is now gushing out to fulfill all of our needs, to give us the salvation we desire. This is our God. This is the God we worship. And the first step to avoiding that Masa and Meribah mistake is to praise and to worship God, to take our eyes off of our entitlement, all the things we think we deserve, all the things we want, all the things we think we need, our grievances, our hurts, our bitterness, and to fix our eyes instead on God and on his excellent greatness. And then as we worship, we also must bow down. And here's where it gets really difficult. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hands. It's hard to kneel, isn't it? And I don't just mean physically, although I know there's a few people here, if you kneel, it's going to be a long time before you get back up. I understand that. I'm not talking about that. I mean spiritually, it is hard to kneel, isn't it? It is hard to say to anybody... You are greater than I am. And so therefore I bow before you in homage and acknowledge you are better than I. It is hard to say you are God. I am not God. It is hard to say God, not my will. Not my will, but your will be done. That's maybe the hardest thing in the world to say. But the psalm tells us here that we must bow down to this maker, this great God, this great king above all gods, for he is our God and we are his sheep. Again, folks, that's not a flattering metaphor, is it? It's no great compliment to be called a sheep. I don't recommend it if you're trying to keep a good friend. Sheep are not smart, sheep are not fast, sheep are not brave. Sheep need a shepherd if they're going to survive, at least domestic sheep, which is what we're talking about here. And in the same way, we need God. We need to bow before him. We need to trust him and his will for our lives. We need to trust he cares for us. We need to trust he will deliver us. He will protect us. He will provide even for our most basic needs, even food and water. And we need to yield, therefore, our will for our lives to him and to worship him and to obey him. For if we don't, the psalm is very clear here, if we don't, If we don't worship, if we don't bow, if we don't yield, if instead we harden our hearts against him and grumble against him and complain against him and are entitled and think that he's not giving us what we think we deserve, if we live that way, then he says we will not enter his rest. And for the Israelites, that meant losing out on the promised land for a whole generation But for us, it's an even bigger deal. We didn't have time to read today from Hebrews, but the author of Hebrews extensively 
quotes Psalm 95. In chapters 3 and 4 of Hebrews, the author says there's a great parallel here for us today if we harden our hearts against God, if we persist in our unbelief, if we refuse to hear his voice and obey him, then today, if we live that way, we will not enter God's greater rest. We will not enter God's salvation. We will not enter the new promised land, the new heavens and the new earth. We will not receive that blessing of eternal fellowship with God in the new creation. We always must remember, God has done all the work that is necessary for our salvation, his rest, his promised land, his salvation, he gives to us as a gift, but the prerequisite for receiving that is kneeling before God and saying, you are God and I am not. You are holy and I am sinful. And I yield to you, Lord. Please save me. Please forgive me. Please bless me. I am yours. I trust you. And I'm willing to live now and forever as your child and as a sheep of your flock. If we don't do that, if we don't worship and bow down and repent and give ourselves back to him, then we cannot enter his rest because his rest is only for those who bow before him and receive it and say that they need it. And Psalm 95 is a warning to us about all of this. The author saying, learn from our history. Don't make the same mistakes that our forefathers made. Don't be like they were at Massa and Meribah. There's a lot at stake here. It's a big deal. So the question is, do you worship regularly? Do you regularly bow before the Lord, our God, our maker? Do you kneel before him? Or instead, do you harden your heart and make demands of God and complaints against God and lift yourself up over against God and make you the center of your own universe? You know, one way leads to life and to rest, the other does not. Which will we choose? May we have the wisdom to choose life and rest and joy and peace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To him alone be the glory. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the gift of rest and salvation that you give to us. We thank you that you are indeed a great God, that you are our God, our maker, our shepherd, and that we are the sheep of your hand. Help us each day, Lord, to have soft and pliable hearts. Help us to bow before you and worship and receive all the great blessings that you would give to us. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.